Hey there, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we're going to be doing a chat all about autoimmune gut disease, talking about the root cause of most autoimmune conditions tends to emanate in the gut. And you see many other conditions that will happen because of it. Hashimoto's, type 1 diabetes, uh, multiple sclerosis, other types of autoimmune issues, even type 1 diabetes. So let's dive in. Evan, how are we doing today, man? Hey, man, happy Monday to you. I've got some statistics, so why don't we start out this podcast with some statistics from the Center for Disease Control in 2015. That's the latest research I can find. Three million people are reported being diagnosed. Now, here's the important part. Three million people are being reported diagnosed. So how many people are having these issues and they are not diagnosed? But this was with irritable bowel disease, which would either be Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. We're not even talking about all the different flavors of gut. We're not talking just IBS that doesn't have an official diagnosis. We're talking literally Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, which are not good, 3 million people. And so, uh, the, of course, it says here that compared with adults without IBD, those with IBD are more likely to have chronic health conditions like cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, cancer, arthritis, kidney disease, liver disease. So we know, because we've talked about it all the time, once you get autoimmune disease, you're several times, depending on what study you look at, several to five to 10 times more likely to get another autoimmune disease. So it's very likely that if someone's listening to this and they have, let's say, Sjogren's or Hashimoto's or uh, rheumatoid arthritis, they're more prone to get IBD of some sort. Absolutely. So with irritable bowel disease, you have your two main ones, which are going to be like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. These are like inflammatory conditions where we see potential ulceration. Like in Crohn's, we see these various skip lesions. In ulcerative colitis, it's primarily in the colon. We see bleeding, right? Ulcerations in blood in the stool. We may see high levels of calprotectin. We may see immune markers off the charts, like either high IgA because the immune reaction is acute. And, or, or very low and depleted immune system because we have um, a chronic immune issue. And we also may see low ferritin and low iron levels because we're not able to absorb and, and digest a lot of our iron. We may even see wasting issues. We're not able to gain weight. We may see lower protein markers too, like, like um, creatinine and bun and just serum protein. So these may be other markers we see. Now, there are other types of issues in the gut, like microscopic colitis, those type of things that are like inflammation, but they're not irritable. They're not, they're not like inflammatory, like you would see with ulcerative colitis there. There's issues with the gut, but they're not at that. Um, let's just say full on board inflammatory presentation. You made a good point. So like low ferritin, uh, low iron, there's yeah. certain type of anemia. So in these people, they may be presenting with other symptoms like hair loss, fatigue. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned the, the muscle wasting yeah. potentially. Uh, so loss of muscle mass could be happening. And then um, did I say hair loss already? Because hair loss is going to be huge too. Because yeah, we're not breaking down iron, protein and minerals, right? We're not going to have the building blocks for our hair. Your nails, your skin, your yeah. hair, all that could be affected. You may be short of breath because we see a lot of women. And when their ferritin levels are below 40, we start to see that they can't catch their breath because you don't have enough oxygen in your body because now you're going to be low on your red blood cells too. So the whole thing can get nasty pretty quick. And the conventional medical route is just not pretty with this whole IBD category. It's just uh, basically biologic drugs, right? It's something trying to modify the immune system. Yeah, I mean, you have your biologic drugs, you have your immunosuppressant medications, right? Uh, your methotrexate or even your, like your, essentially your chemotherapy is used a lot of time for a lot of these irritable bowel diseases. And then you have your high dose steroids, your prednisone. So you kind of only have a couple of options, right? There's things like Lialdo or Mesalamine, which are kind of in that anti-inflammatory gut category. And then some of these things may be acceptable for an acute period. The problem is a lot of patients, they're on these things for their life. So then what do you do? Because there's other side effects like high blood sugar and adrenal issues and even um, bone loss and other issues from these medications. Obviously, suppressing your immune system isn't good. That could uh, allow you to be susceptible to other types of issues, maybe even cancers and such, right? Yeah. So we have a lot of problems that are happening because of the medications, and they may be acceptable for an acute time frame, but they're not addressing the root cause. And we always have to look at the root cause, and not to mention, not really even talking about the standard American diet. I can't tell you how many patients I've seen that have Crohn's or ulcerative colitis that I've helped get into remission, and their, you know, their gastroenterologist just didn't even 
they didn't even really care to ask like as like lesions were he healing and fistulas were healing and inflammation was going down there wasn't even like a sense of like hey what are you doing hey are you making diet changes there wasn't really this sense of curiosity like what are you doing even though they were seeing objective improvements in the mucosa and in their intestines and their inflammatory markers and their iron and also their b12 levels b12 is another type of anemia you have your macrocytic anemia where low b12 causes big um big blood cells and then you have your microcytic anemia where low iron can cause really weak anemic small tiny blood cells so b12 big blood cells low iron uh, small blood cells when i had uh, dr nasha winters on my podcast and we were talking about natural approaches to cancer she said that she had worked with people using mistletoe and several other herbs to address cancer and that, and sometimes these cases of cancer would just spontaneously disappear and go into remission. Tumors would shrink. Tumors would disappear. People were off of chemotherapy. They no longer needed medication. And the oncologist had 0% interest in figuring out what these patients did. They just said, well, I don't know what you did, but you don't have cancer anymore. You know, get out of my office. And that was the end of it. It was just mind blowing. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, you got to put yourself in the doctor's position, right? You've spent anywhere between a quarter to a half a million dollars over 10 to 12 years of your life studying something. And how could you not have been taught this? How is this missing from your curricula? So even if it is right, there has to be this intellectual open mindedness to say, hey, I wasn't taught all the most cutting edge, really important things in medical school or my residency training. There's this kind of come to Jesus moment where you're like, man, did they like, why didn't I learn it? Like, I thought my, my education was the best. I thought doctors and medical doctors know it all. And it's really hard because some people, they either have that moment. And a lot of times, in my opinion, the doctors that really have the moment are the ones that experience it personally, where they have a personal health challenge and then they overcome it and they feel it themselves personally or a very close loved one. It's really hard for most doctors to wake up through their patients. It's a little bit harder just because you can, you're a little more detached. You can excuse things. You can say spontaneous remission, yada, yada, yada. But when it's you or a really close person that maybe you live with and you can see, then I think you're a little bit more open-minded to it. Yeah. That's, I think that's what makes us good practitioners is that you and I have both had our own journey of suffering. You know, I dealt with so many gut issues myself and mood issues through college and you know, yeah. I just had prescription drugs written for me, like really high strength ibuprofen and antispasmatic yeah. drugs and acid blocking medications. And I didn't take any of them. And it's tough because you got to look at like your conventional medical doctor, right? A lot of conventional medical doctors, they may not be like the best communicators from like a sales and marketing standpoint. So if you're going outside of the insurance or hospital model, you have to really be able to communicate with the public to be able to help people, to engage people and to get patients. It's really easy to just sit there you know, kind of in the handout line of the insurance model of having patients just dropped off at your office. That's really convenient and easy. And it's hard to do that, especially maybe if you don't have the best skill set to go out there and communicate like we do to hundreds of thousands of people every week. So it's tough. Yeah. People get into this pattern and they their whole livelihood's invested. So it's this really difficult situation that they're in. So um yeah. A little, you know, bit of a, a little bit of a tangent, but a very important tangent. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's important because number one, why aren't these doctors able to confront people that are getting better? That's number one. And then number two, um, that your doctor may not know it all. And this is the reason why. It's because of the education is geared to a pharmaceutical, surgical-based kind of outcome protocol. And everything we're doing to fix autoimmune issues doesn't exist in that realm. So what's the big mechanism that we're seeing here with autoimmune issues? It's going to be gut permeability, right? Being able to separate the outside from the inside of the gut is, is very, very, very important. Um, and it's, and that's actually really important to think too, when you swallow something and it's in your intestinal tract, it's actually still outside of your body. That's kind of hard to wrap your head around because then it gets absorbed into the, to the microvilli, into the bloodstream. Now it's inside of your body. So even though you swallow it, it's still technically outside of your gut tract or outside of your, your digestive system, outside of your body. But then it goes into your body through absorption. And that gut permeability is one of the big factors that can create autoimmune issues. So we have undigested food proteins, undigested bacteria and endotoxins that can get through the bloodstream and really exacerbate and flare up the immune response. So get this, this is going to blow your mind here. I'm looking at a study right now, which is about EMF and gut permeability. And it's a, it's a, it is a study uh, from 2017 
titled Evaluation of the Effect of Radio Frequency Radiation Emitted from Wi-Fi Router and Mobile Phone Simulator. And it just talks about the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi connection and the 900 uh, megahertz mobile phone connection and how this can affect the gut barrier. So when we talk about diet, it's a huge piece of the puzzle. But then I think about all these women, you know, especially you and I, we work with a lot of teenagers too. Like I've had, you know, women that are 17, 18, 19 years old and they wear their yoga pants and then they've got their cell phone right on their hip of their, of their yoga pants but they have a perfect diet. Like they're already on like a paleo diet or an autoimmune diet. We get the gut, the gut testing done. Maybe they don't have many infections, but all of a sudden they've got this major gut problem. I'm not going to say all of it is tied into EMF, but you can measure using a little portable EMF meter. I've got one called the safe and sound that I use little RF meter. You can measure that. And so I think RF radiation, if you got your phone on your hip all day, or if you talk with our friend Jack Wolfson, you've got guys with the chest pocket on their shirt with a cell phone over their heart and yeah. he's seeing like atrial flutter and AFib and all these other heart issues from EMF. So I think if you're trying to heal your gut and you've got your smartphone on your stomach all day, that's probably not a good thing to do. Yeah. I mean, you definitely don't want it near any sensitive neurological tissue. And if it's, if you're at a desk all day, keep it on your desk, right? I have it on a little tripod, five, you know, three, four feet away from me at least all day. Yeah, that's what I've they, got. There. I've got the thing end. And then from I'm walking good. around, I keep it on my, I keep it on a holster on my hip. Um, if I'm walking around, I, I don't keep it in my pocket. Again, the radiation is the highest within the first inch of the phone. Yeah. So whatever that tissue is within the first inch, that's going to be the most important. So some girls, they'll have it like right, clipped right on top of their breast tissue. Be careful. A lot of guys will have it in their front pockets. I mean, I think having it in your back pocket is probably pretty safe just because there's a lot of thick tissue, dense tissue there, and there's not anything really sensitive on the neurological side. So, But in general, like a good holster, um, ideally, if if you can line it with something, I put an EMF neutralizer on my phone, but I think, you know, don't put it up against your head, try to keep it away from your body. But in general, I think it's one minor stressor in the stress bucket. I think there's a lot of other things that would come be, even be a higher priority above that, but definitely yeah. don't talk against it, get a headset and keep it out of your pockets for sure. I would still say if you had to pick and choose your battles, you know, if you have your diet dialed in and you use your phone that's, that's okay. Like you still got to use your phone. So like if you're still eating a bunch of dairy, conventional dairy, you're eating a lot of grains, especially non-organic grains that are sprayed. You know, people talk about the levels of glyphosate in grains. It's insanely high. And we know that glyphosate kills off beneficial bacteria in the gut. So when we're trying to find mechanisms, you know, how did someone end up in the situation? You know, the gastro doctor doesn't ask you how much percent of your diet is organic. Like you could have a paleo diet that is not organic and then you can have a paleo yeah. diet that's organic and then you can have an autoimmune paleo diet that's organic. And that's going to be like your highest tier because if you still eat a bunch of conventional meats, all those meats can have the chemicals from the grain. So if you're doing like a straight corn fed GMO corn, 98% right. of corn in America is GMO, even 99%. All of it's contaminated with mycotoxins. Just Google it for yourself. Corn mycotoxin study. All corn in the U.S. has mycotoxins, which are mold, um, basically the off-gassing of mold. That damages your gut barrier too. Just type in mycotoxin intestinal permeability. We know that mold exposure creates leaky gut too. So if you're eating a corn-fed burger, that's damaging your gut barrier. Even if you think, hey, this is paleo, this is meat. Not necessarily. There's a caveat to that. 100%. So what's, how does this work? So there's a genetic predisposition, right? Where you may have the genetic predisposition, the genes that may predispose it, but a lot of the time people are confusing genetics predisposition as genetic, uh, what's that? I would call it genetic destiny. Yes. Genetic destiny. Meaning you have these genes, you're destined for this, but it's like, Hey, you know, you may have um, let's say your genes are like a ver like various light switches. You may have all these various light switches that if that light switch is flipped on, you may develop cancer or some kind of autoimmune gut issue like we're talking about, but you have the ability to not flip it on. And you do that by keeping inflammation down, by keeping nutrient density up, by keeping toxins down. And we know toxins play a huge role in gut permeability. Um, that Roundup case down in LA, I think Bayer bought uh, Monsanto and Roundup Basically, again, I think the appeal process went through. There was another trial that went through saying that Roundup 
did cause cancer in this patient, according to the jury trial. I think we've known this for a long time. There's been a lot of studies over in Italy showing a lot of these tumor growth. But in general, what we know is that Roundup, if you look at some of the studies where they look at the gut lining, they can really rip up the gut lining. I think Dr. Stephanie Senef talked about this at MIT. So the gut permeability component is really important. And then, of course, just the pesticides as well can disrupt the gut bacteria, and that can create more dysbiotic kind of overgrowth. So you can see more of this Prevotella, Citrobacter, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, a lot of these dysbiotic strains really start to go up. And of course, then our beneficial probiotic strains are going to start to go down. So we get this dysbiotic overgrowth that can really predispose a lot of issues as well. And that there's a lot of studies looking at these dysbiotic bacteria and correlating with them with autoimmune conditions. So we know this strong connection with you know all these autoimmune conditions, whether it's RA, whether it's rheumatoid, um, whether it's ulcerative colitis, whether it's type one diabetes or Crohn's or celiac, you know, there's a big connection with a lot of these microbiome dysbiotic overgrowths. Yeah, I'm gonna restate. I'm gonna restate that in a different way, just to make sure it gets through people's head, because what yeah. you're saying is very important for people to understand. And you're not mm -hmm. gonna hear this from your doctor. Pesticides, whether this is something you're spraying on your yard, whether this is something that's in your food because you're eating non-organic food whether this is you live in farm country and you have people like you're in the Valley of California and you see these planes at an almond farm spraying overhead, they're spraying the pesticides. Yep. That stuff kills good bacteria at the parts per billion level, PPB. So if you kill the good bacteria in your gut, these bad bacteria that Justin's mentioned, your Pseudomonas, your Klebsiella, your Proteus, all your autoimmune bacteria, those autoimmune triggering bacteria thrive and flourish because the good guys got killed off right. due to pesticide and then you develop the leaky gut and then the leaky gut leads to the autoimmune condition so it can all be linked back to your environment you living in farm country and your neighbor spraying tons of glyphosate or you use this crap which i have a picture of on my phone this is uh, i went to home depot over the weekend which is a local uh not local but it's a corporate store people probably can't see the picture on my camera but it's scott's brand scott's turf builder it's called weed and feed and oh justin listen to how gentle it sounds weed grip technology it cleans no i'm sorry it clears out dandelion and clover so it doesn't kill them by using toxic things that destroy your gut barrier and lead to autoimmune disease no it doesn't do that it clears out the dandelion and then you look at here at the active ingredients 2,4-D is the active ingredient and 2,4-D is the agent orange chemical that Justin and I test for on urine. Yep. And this 2,4-D is, oh, let's just, let me just scoop this up in my hand and let me put this in my little grass eater. And I'm just going to have a smile on my face as I spread this crap all over my lawn. And then I'm going to let my dog come play in the yard. And then I'm going to let my children play in the grass. And it's covered in 2,4-D. And then the kid gets juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which is a new term that didn't even used to exist. It used to just be rheumatoid arthritis. Now they have juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It could all be linked back to this crap. You're buying grass seed at Home Depot with pesticide in it. So pay attention. Just use regular grass seed. Don't be using this crap. Dandelions are good for you. Stop killing them. 100%, man. Yeah, we got to look at the root underlying mechanism. So I think we hit the toxin mechanism. And then also just forget the fact that a lot of the pesticides, especially the Roundups, they're going to hug away beneficial minerals. Part of the reason why they work is they kind of, they bind and they chelate or they hug away all these beneficial minerals. So then let's say you're growing or you're buying food grown in that soil, it's going to be significantly more nutrient deficient. So you're going to have less minerals, less manganese, magnesium, zinc. We know if we're low in certain minerals, those plants are also going to express deficiencies in vitamins, right? We know like low manganese in the soil correlates with lower vitamin C in that various plant. So, I mean, there's more than likely correlations with every mineral in the soil correlating to lower vitamins in that plant. So that's going to mean lower minerals for you and lower vitamins as well in the plants. And then if you're eating animals as well and they're eating that soil, then guess what? Low vitamins and minerals in the uh, animal protein too. Well, let's take that a step further, okay? So now you're saying we're going to be low in minerals. So then what's going to happen then? Well, we know if you're going to be low in magnesium, you may get heart palpitations. You may get anxiety. You may get restless leg syndrome where you're laying in bed and you're just tapping your little foot in your bed. You may have a, like a tremor or twitching. You may have shaking. Um, you may have headaches because you're deficient in minerals. You may have more neurological stuff, like you could have forgetfulness, you could have brain fog, you could have chronic fatigue because now you don't have minerals 
to fuel your energy cycles in the body. So, I mean, if people, you know, people don't just have one symptom, like if they have a diagnosis like Crohn's disease, it's not just going to be their gut. It's going to be everything. They could be depressed. They could have anxiety. They could have bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and that could all trace back to this deficiency in minerals. You mentioned the whole zinc thing, you know, zinc deficiency is huge. You could have a zinc copper imbalance. So now you've got neurological problems. And then the conventional doctor, what are they going to do with your neurological or anxiety complaints or depression complaints? They refer you out to the psychiatrist. And then what do they do? Well, Butrin, Zoloft, Paxil, Prozac, that's their treatment, which is still not root cause. 100%. And again, there's been twin studies out there that look at various twins who have the exact same genetic code, right? Except 50% of them don't get the same condition, autoimmune disease, as their twin counterparts. So this is not just a genetic issue. It's the epigenetics that happen kind of above the genes. Remember the initial the analogy I gave of flipping the switch on? So we look at it. What's the underlying stressors? Here's our stress bucket. Physical, chemical, emotional stressors all go in that bucket. Emotional stressors being, you know, friends, family, relationships, work, all that stuff. The, chem the uh, chemical stressors are going to be gluten sensitivity, gut bacteria, parasites, and infections. Infections are another component. We talked about bacterial overgrowth, there's fungal overgrowth, and even parasitic infections, which can increase autoimmunity as well. And then obviously heavy metals, pesticides, Roundup fits in that same category, and nutrient deficiencies, poor digestion, low stomach acid, low enzymes, food allergens. And yeah, course, this is why you need a practitioner. Yeah, and of course, all of the other hormonal imbalances like low thyroid, low adrenals, um, female hormone, estrogen dominance is a big one. That's part of the reason why women tend to be four or five times more likely to have an autoimmune condition compared to men is because estrogen tends to upregulate the various CD4 cells um, a little bit more than you see with men. So estrogen dominance is a big driving factor. And then of course, the physical stressors, like I mentioned, um, exercising too much or not doing enough movement. And then of course, just not getting good sleep. So these kind of fit into our stress bucket. These cause our body systems to break down hormone, gut, digestion, infections, or, or hormones, hormones essentially in system one, digestion, infection, system two, detox and nutrients in system three, these systems start to break down. And then we have symptoms downstream over here, whether it's blood in your stool, pain in your gut, bloating, gas, constipation. Most doctors here would say, okay, you have a constellation of symptoms that may be ulcerative colitis. We're going to give you mesalamine. We're going to give you Lialdo. We're going to give you prednisone. We're going to give you immunosuppressants. We're going to give you all these things, but they're not getting to the root cause and the systems, and they're not looking at the underlying stressors that caused the whole issue to happen to begin with. So we want to, we really want to be looking upstream and not myopically focused downstream. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, that's the, that's the crazy thing about this is you can't, I mean, you, so, so if you want to be a good practitioner, you have to focus on symptoms, but you always got to trace it back. So I'm glad you did that because I was like going on a rant there and you, you did a great job of like reeling it back in. Okay. So the symptom, you got to trace that symptom back to a body system that's dysfunctioning. Okay. So it's a detoxification issue. Like with estrogen dominance, it's a detoxification problem. So the liver could be overburdened due to all these pesticides. So now the liver can't do its process to get rid of excess estrogen. So then the estrogen dominance problem grows because the liver has so much stress because you're eating a bunch of corn fed meat that's sprayed or you've eaten a bunch of strawberries or you're doing uh, sweet potatoes. Everybody loves sweet potatoes, but the average sweet potato that's not organic has 20 pesticides on it. The average strawberry, according to the environmental working group, has 22 pesticides on it. So you put all that crap in that toxin bucket. And then you mentioned the emotional piece too. So let's say, you know, you've got a bad boss, a bad spouse, a bad family member. I mean, that stuff is all part of our problem too. So this stuff gets complicated, but we do break it down into the body system. So this is why, you know, I get frustrated when people say, well, I bought this probiotic and it didn't help me. Or I bought this glutamine for my gut because I heard glutamine can heal leaky gut. Or I bought... Um, this gut healing mineral online because I saw this guy did a podcast on it and he said right. this 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 supplement's going to clear up my gut. Well, you can't just pick one little tiny piece of this puzzle and expect that to fix you. You've really got to get these systems tested, addressed, and then you retest. So if you look at adrenals, maybe you have really high cortisol because you hate your boss and your high cortisol all day at work is damaging your gut barrier. Maybe you are organic with your diet, but maybe it's the cortisol. So we have to test it, right? So this is why you can't just go buy a random supplement at Whole Foods and expect exactly. to get your, your gut better. 
100%. Now, off the bat, of course, we can eat organic and definitely hormone-free. If we're on a budget, let's look at the dirty dozen, right? These are the foods that are going to have the highest pesticide residue. Strawberry, spinach, nectarines, apples, peaches, pears, cherries, grapes, celery, tomatoes, sweet, sweet bell peppers. I'll put links in the, proto in the uh, reference sheet here for the notes on the podcast transcription. So look at it there. And then our clean 15 dozen foods. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're listening yeah. off? Yep. And then we'll put the link and image in the podcast notes. And then the clean 15, these are the ones that have the lowest uh, pesticide residue. So avocados, sweet corn, pineapples, cabbage, onions, sweet peas, papayas, asparagus, mangoes, eggplants, honeydew. And then maybe one more. Then there's um, kiwi, cantaloupe, cauliflower, and broccoli. But Isn't we'll that a dude? Here's, here's what's crazy to me that broccoli's on the clean 15. Because when I grow broccoli in my garden, and you've got the leaves that come out of it, and then you've got the broccoli head just sitting in the middle of it. It seems like, how could that be clean 15? It seems like they would just spray it on top of the surface of the broccoli. I'm, I'm so grateful that it's on the clean 15 because if I go to a restaurant and they have broccoli, I'll order it. But it seems like, how could broccoli be supposedly clean even though it's so exposed to the open air? It always blows my mind. Yeah, I don't understand. It could just be that it's, it's got a little bit more thicker of a fibrous coating because if you look at a lot of the um, dirty dozen, they tend to have a thinner coating, right? True. Strawberries. You could eat strawberries raw. You could eat spinach raw, nectarines raw, apples raw, pears raw, cherries raw. So it seems like it may be just a thicker membrane on the, a lot of the outer vegetables, right? So clean 15, avocados, right? Skin, uh, pineapple, skin. Yeah. Peas, there's a pot over it, right? Mangoes, right? You got to peel it. So it seems like it's more of a thicker fibrous kind of peel that may be associated with the clean 15. That's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Well, where, where should we go from here? I mean, I could just rant all day about pesticides, yeah. but you mentioned the stress piece. We talked about adrenals. So testing for adrenals. We talked about grains, pulling out grains, getting people on an autoimmune diet, likely pulling out the dairy, uh, making sure the meats are grass fed and not GMO corn fed meats. And yeah. then we and then, and then we go into testing the gut because you mentioned the infections. You and I yeah. see so many cases of parasites. I think number one, when you work with a good functional medicine practitioner, there's a certain kind of protocol that you want to work through so you don't miss anything. And the problem is a lot of patients, they come through doing one-offs. They do just this thing right or that thing right, and they haven't done everything together. And that kind of makes them a little bit jaded to pull the trigger doing certain things in the future. So when we work through patients, there's a six-hour approach. We're removing the bad foods. And again, that may be a little bit different for everyone. Like I mentioned, we may need to do more autoimmune or specific carbohydrate or gaps or low FODMAP templates, depending on how bad or damaged someone's gut is. Maybe even an elemental diet. We may be number two, we're going to be replacing enzymes and acids. If we have a hard time breaking that food down, we may have a problem. We may even have to do an elemental diet if someone has severe Crohn's or ulcerative colitis because their gut is just bleeding on the inside. And then number three, we're going to be repairing the hormones and we're going to be working on nutrients to help the gut lining. And we've talked about some of the nutrients, but in general, we may do things that have L-glutamine in it, uh, collagen. We may do things that have um, various probiotics in there. We may do um, colostrum. We may do other anti-inflammatory compounds, aloe, ginger, slippery elm, zinc carnosine, other really good healing nutrients. Then on the remove side, this is where we're rem the second remove, where we start to remove the infections. And sometimes with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's and, and irritable bowel disease, we have to wait longer because the gut is so ripped up and so shredded, coming in there and doing a whole bunch of killing could be very inflammatory. So if you're listening to this and you're in that category, you want to work with someone and you really want to make sure those first three hours get 100% dialed in before we progress to that fourth R. And then a fifth R will work on repopulating and re-inoculating with a lot of good bacteria. And if you're really sensitive to probiotics, maybe certain sporebiotic or soil-based strains we have to use instead. And then the six R is retest because sometimes there's new infections. And then yeah. you really, if you have a partner or a spouse, you really have to make sure that person is addressed as well if there are chronic infections because you guys can hot potato and pass things back and forth. That's really important. Yeah, I love the hot potato analogy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've seen that time and time again, right? Where we'll fix a woman's gut and then we retest her stool. And then all of a sudden she's got an H. pylori infection again. And we're like, okay, like, how did you get rid of it? Like, we got rid of this. And how did you pick this up again? And then finally we get the stubborn husband on board. Maybe he's not stubborn. Maybe he's awesome and he was too too busy or he was out of town or whatever. But a lot of times the, hub the husband is stubborn and says, well, I don't have symptoms. Why do I need to test my gut? My wife is the one complaining I don't have complaints. I don't have skin issues like her. I'm not tired like she is. I don't have autoimmune disease. It's like, well, you could be the vector. You could be the one passing her the infection. So we don't care that you feel amazing. Congratulations. 
but we still got to make sure you're not the problem and you're not the one reinfecting your wife and making her sick because she's susceptible. Yeah. And I, I tell patients sometimes, you know, talk to their spouse about it. It's not an STD, but sometimes we got to treat it like an STD because people will treat the STD a little bit more respectfully. No one's going to say, well, just because I'm the carrier of herpes and I don't have it, like whatever, it's not a big deal. No, you got to address it. Same thing with any other STD. It's not in that category, but it can still be transmitted via intimacy. So we want to make sure we address that and it doesn't go back and forth. And then of course, there's even things like H. pylori, which could even be spread via saliva, which may not even be, you know, obviously that's not even gonna be a sexual thing. You could just kissing your kid on the on the cheek uh, or on the lips, um, or sharing, sharing, oh. sharing silverware or knives, those kind of things. And all, honestly, if someone's not even washing their hands appropriately after the bathroom, you know, you may be able to spread a parasite via that way too. That's very common. We, I mean, I would say anything's possible, right? I mean, we've tested yeah. thousands people. We see worms that the whole family could have. We've seen parasites that the whole family can have. That's why I really love working with families because if we get mom and dad tested and then we get the kids tested too, yeah. and we get to compare the guts. That is my favorite part of my, my job is, is okay. Mom has this daughter has this husband right. has this, and we get to pin the pieces together. Oh, well, daughter goes to a school or daughter goes to a daycare. So she might have picked up that there and then dad had this and mom had that. So they pass it to each other. It's it's just it's fun to make the connections like that with the family. Oh, 100 percent. Anything else you want to address here today? Do we have any questions you want to dive into, Evan? Uh, well, while, while you're looking at questions, I'll just say that I mean, since I brought up the whole family thing, it's much easier to do this as a family. So if you are someone struggling and you have a husband who's not on board with your diet. So here you are eating your grass fed steak and broccoli and he wants to eat pizza or, you know, the, or you are a divorced family and you're taking care of a child that's sick with an autoimmune disease or a gut disease. And, and the kid eats really good at your house, but then you send them over to dad's house or you send them over to grandma's house and then they get sick because they're eating foods over there. That that's a huge thing. So make sure that you have the whole family on board because when you get to this level of gut problems, there's not any room for cheating. So your kid can't eat autoimmune paleo five days a week. And then the kid goes somewhere else on the weekend and go eats pizza and like cheese sticks and waffles on the weekend. And then they come back to you and then they're recovering and then they get sent back again. Right. So you can't be, you can't just be picking and choosing when you want to be healthy. This has to become a lifestyle change for the whole family. And if your family members are not on board, uh, babysitters, nannies, grandmas, grandpas, dads, cousins, whoever is taking care of your children, or you, if you've got friends or family that are saying, Hey, Justin, eat this piece of cake. I promise it's just a little bit of gluten. It's not going to hurt you. No, you got to say, no, if you're not going to support me, you got to get away. You can't be pushing this crap onto me. Yeah. And of course we draw a line, right? If you have autoimmune issues, there, there's a zero tolerance. Maybe if you, if you don't have an autoimmune issue, there's a little bit more flexibility. I always tell patients, always try to go gluten grain free when you have an opportunity, but if there's something really special occasion, fine. Um, you know, just do your best on that. So it just, we only really got to draw that line though, but for sure when there's, when there's known autoimmune issues, 100%. Yeah. Oh, somebody said they love my rants. Did you see that one? <laughs> I saw that. That's great. That's excellent. Really cool. And then also someone says opinion on methotrexate for 13 year old with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. So yeah, I mean, number one, you got to work with someone that's talking about all the things that we're talking about. So feel free and check out Evan or my site and, and dive in. But yeah, you do not want that to be the long-term solution to address this issue. Okay. I know yeah. that's going to be the conventional standard of care. Um, and that may be fine acutely, but not in the long run for sure. It's just not addressing the root cause. That's all. No, it's not. And there was a second part of the question. How do you feel about red light therapy to treat juvenile rheumatoid arthritis? Well, red light therapy would be considered a palliative, a palliative care. Yeah. Maybe it will help uh, far better than a drug, but it's still not root cause. That kid needs nope. to get a stool test, figure out what kind of infections are going on, make sure the diet's dialed in, start looking at mineral deficiencies and all the stuff Justin hit on earlier. Yep, 100%. And then someone asked a question about, I think I started on iron here. Let me see if I can find that question. Yeah, I saw, I saw a question. There was a couple questions about iron. Yeah, so they talked about what, how to test for iron. So the first thing is we're looking at iron serum. That's going to kind of give you a window of what's in the engine. Okay. Then we look at ferritin. That's the equivalent of what's in the gas tank. And then we look at TIBC and UIC, which gives us a window into um, – 
essentially the receptor sites, the binding proteins. The, the higher they are, it's like, you know, for instance, the hungrier I am, the more I'm, I'm grabbing, right? The more I'm grabbing. So think of it, the more I'm grabbing, the more fingers, the more hands reaching, that's like the binding proteins being higher. It's trying to grab more of that iron. And then, of course, we have the iron saturation. Think of that as like the the um, gasoline in the carburetor. Is it fully saturated? Is it is it all the way up in there? So we look at all those markers to get a window into what's going on. Yeah, blood testing can be good for these type of problems. Blood testing from a functional perspective is is helpful, but if someone's not where they already have a full-blown diagnosis, we may not need blood work right away on someone. We may go straight to the stool testing, organic acids testing, look at that first, and if we need further information, at least how that's how, how that's I approach. I don't know, Justin, if you do blood right in the beginning, but sometimes I don't. I'll go stool urine first and then do blood later if we feel like we're missing a piece. Yeah, it depends. If someone, if I see... IBD, irritable bowel disease, I'll definitely do some blood work just to see where they're at with the iron and the ferritin and all yep. that. And, and then we'll definitely run an organic acid to see how the methylmalonic acid looks so we can see how the B vitamins and B12 look. So that's, we definitely want to get a window in those if we see those kind of problems. Yeah, but if they're not gut disease level, they're just some complaints about gut, you may not go straight into blood right away. Or do I would have to have some history that, that would screen that for me. Yeah. Right. And then a lot of patients, they come in with a lot of blood to begin with. So, True. you know, I could maybe see like, hey, maybe the RBCs is in the very low fours. Maybe that hematocrit and hemoglobin are, are creeping into the, you know, in the mid 11s for hemoglobin or hematocrit in like the upper 30s. So depending on what comes back, I may, I may want to run more tests depending on what I see from their previous labs. Yeah, there was someone who said um, a future topic suggestion, interpreting the oat test. Your doctor ordered the test for you, but then doesn't know how to interpret it. That's so funny. I'm sorry. There's a lot of doctors out there that run testing because they hear about it from people like us, and then they don't know what to do with the test. So then you have this like 75 marker information, which is just a pot of gold for Justin and I, but then other practitioners don't know what to do about it. I would say hang tight. Eventually, Justin and I both will have a training course all about organic acid testing. That's like our bread and butter. We love it. Uh, but in terms of a podcast on interpreting the oat, that's that's not really a good podcast thing. I've done a couple of videos on it. So if you go in, just Google Dr. Justin organic acids, you'll find a couple of things where I've really gone a little bit more in depth on that. I've done a few videos too about like looking at candida overgrowth and bacterial overgrowth. So some interpretation but I'm hesitant to say, hey, if you see this problem, then you need this herb because it's not ever black and white like that. Exactly. Yep. And then T-Bone writes in, what's your take on doing elemental formula the first half of the day? I love that. I do that with a lot of my gut and flame patients where just that first six hours of the day, maybe even eight hours, we'll have them on an elemental formula with some good like Udo's oil or good fat in there. And they just sip it throughout the day. And it just kind of gives their gut a break while they still get good anti-inflammatory nutrients in their body too. Yeah, Matt White uh, left a comment. There's an interpretation guide by organics. Yeah, so like Genova, Great Plains, these companies do produce like an, an interpretation guide of some of the markers. Um, but once again, it doesn't always lead you in the direction of what do you do because their uh, recommendations are very cookie cutter. You may look at one particular marker and, and they'll say it may be carnitine deficiency. So you may supplement carnitine, but it could be 20 other causes too. So. Right. And like you'll see with, I think, picolinate, it'll be like, oh, you need more omega threes, but it's a sign of inflammation. So then you got to say, where's the inflammation coming from? Right. Yeah. Is it coming from the gut. So you got to look, you got to know, okay, what does that mean? What's the next thing I got to pivot to? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And Lambros came in, Dr. J, I just got back my new thyroid labs, TSH, free T4, free T3. Should I further adjust the dose? Yeah, I mean, I would say your T3 is in the bottom, it's, it's in the bottom 5% of the reference range. So looking where you're at, I would definitely adjust your dose based on, you know, one equivalent based on your protocol sheet. Yeah, sure. this person here, they they uh, just, so people listening, they're going to be like, well, what's Justin talking about? This person put their free T3 as a 2.1. Uh, that's too low. We want free T3 closer to three. Yep, Exactly. 100%. Anything else you wanted to address here? Uh, one, one other person talked about the um, carnivore diet. And I find with some patients that really do have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, a carnivore template can be really helpful just because you're cutting out all of these anti-nutrients in plants. And Dr. Um, Gundry has talked about this in the book, The Plant Paradox, where he's talked about some of the some of these anti-nutrients and lectins and mineral blockers and protein blockers. And sometimes they can really be a disrupting factor. And believe me, I get some hate email from vegetarians and vegans that are like, how dare you recommend meats? It's so bad. I'm like, hey, I don't have a dog in the fight. 
and then says, you, if, unless you're a clinician and you've seen people do, do, you know, do things and improve and be successful, just be quiet because you don't have any clinical experience to speak from. You're talking like it's a religion. This is not, this is science. And I've seen many patients with ulcerative colitis issues and they have, they have serious resolution. I mean, feel free and just Google Michaela Peterson. And she had serious autoimmune issues that destroyed her bones and a carnivore template was huge for her healing. Check out my podcast with um, Caitlin Weeks. I've had a handful of uh, patients that really have done amazing with carnivore templates that have severe, more autoimmune issues, but some don't, and some an autoimmune paleo templates fine. So that's why you need a customized approach. You need to be non-dogmatic. It's like if I have a whole tool belt full of tools and I got a, is a nail in that wall, I'm not going to use my monkey wrench to whack in that nail no matter how much I love this monkey wrench. I'm going to pull out the right tool for it called the hammer right? Same thing as a clinician with recommending diets. I don't care. I just want the right tool to do, do the right job. Yep. At the end of the day, if you get better, that's what we want. It doesn't matter the path to get you there. So. Nutrition though has become like politics. People have a really yeah. hard time talking about it. It's a very emotional issue and it's not. It's very scientific for me. And um, of course, I think there are common things like you shouldn't have sugar, you know, organic, hormone free. Like those things I think are foundational no matter what template on the spectrum you, you're adjusting your diet to. Of course, right? Old foods don't cause new disease. I think that's a good starting point, and then you can adjust from there. And then obviously looking at the inflammatory value of a lot of these foods too. And if we didn't highlight enough, gluten sensitivity. Gluten's a big issue with autoimmune guys. Even if you don't, you're not celiac, there's still a lot of research by Dr. Alessio Fasano at Harvard that gluten, even if you're not reacting, can increase gut permeability, which increases things getting into the bloodstream that could exacerbate the immune system and attack other tissue that may be an innocent bystander. Absolutely. We could go on a whole rant about that. Maybe we'll do a show on non uh, celiac gluten sensitivity. That'd be cool to get Fasano on here. Yeah, that'd be really good. The uh, problem with these research guys there, you know, I want to, I want to keep it actionable and down to earth. That is true. Uh, so we'll just take the research and we'll just summarize it. But yeah, I think that'd be great. That'd be really cool. That does make it more fun. Yeah, the research, it does get it does get dry. It, and it gets boring. Things. You could take a five-hour study and you can summarize it in two minutes. That's right. Um, but yeah, I, I appreciate it. I think it's great feedback. Anything else, Evan, you want to address? Uh, no, let's wrap this up for today. Uh, we could, I mean, we could do a part two, part three, part four. Yeah. You can never talk enough about stress and how the different mechanisms of stress affect gut barrier function and all that. But for now, let's wrap it up. If people want to reach out to Justin or myself, we can work with you around the world. So go to Justin's website, Justin Health, justinhealth.com, and you can reach out, schedule a call with him or his staff. Me, it's Evan Brand, E V A N brand.com. And we'll be back next week. Thanks, guys. Put your comments below. Want your feedback of new topics? Thumbs up and share. You guys have a phenomenal day, and we'll talk soon. Take care. Take care, Evan. Bye.